Welcome to NucleCast, the official podcast of the ANWA Deterrence Center. Each week, we bring you leading nuclear deterrence experts for a lively discussion on current topics. Our host is Dr. Adam Lowther, Director of Strategic Deterrence Programs at the National Strategic Research Institute. The views of the host and the guests are their own. All right, and welcome back to our latest episode of NucleCast. Today, we are honored to have Senator Kramer from North Dakota. He is our very special guest, and we will be talking about Minot, the modernization program for the weapon systems at Minot Air Force Base. We'll be talking about the long-range standoff cruise missile. We'll be talking about the politics of nuclear modernization and uh, maybe some other uh, interesting topics. Now, uh, for those of you that I won't waste our time going through Senator Kramer's resume, you can, you've probably been to his website. You know who he is. He's one of the Nuclear Enterprises supporters And so I'll let you read everything he's done. He is, of course, on the Senate Armed Services Committee, which, of course, makes this a very special topic to him. Uh, But one of the things we like to do often on NucleCast, before we get into all of the deep topics that we discuss, is we like to ask our guests to give us something that they've They've never really shared with others that might be funny or might be heartfelt, or perhaps you've shared it on the on the the campaign trail. But maybe many of our listeners might not know. So, what kind of story or anecdotal incident do you have to share with us today? Now, see this. No one briefed me on this, so I'm not <laughs> adequately briefed. So now, now you're just going to have to settle for my impulsive, spontaneous transparent and honest response and this I, and I could, would only say this to this audience because you can all be trusted I'm Batman I'm Batman <laughs> and um, <laughs> Batman is my very favorite character uh, in all of, uh, of comic books TV and, and movies and I long time ago when my my uh, sons were little boys we all had Batman costumes Um they, the Batman thing didn't stick with them, but I still have mine. And I, I just, like the nuclear triad, I modernize my Batman costume from time to time <laughs> so that when I go trick-or-treating with my grandchildren or, or meet people at the door on, on Halloween or go to my church's trunk and, trunk or treat, we, we dress up the, the black suburban as the Bat Cave and, um, and I'm Batman. But don't tell anybody else because it, it would really wouldn't be much of a deterrent if they knew. <laughs> well, thanks for that. That's uh, that's a great story. So <laughs> now if we'll switch from the Batman story to some a more serious topic, of course, yeah. and that is the modernization of the nuclear triad. Mm-hmm. Now, you're the senator from North Dakota, of course. Right. You have not only is Minot a base in your state, but Minot's a unique base because it has both the ICBM leg and the bomber leg. So Mm -hmm. you have two legs of the triad that you have to worry about modernization. Could you maybe just, for our listeners, give them, you know, some explanation as to why you think modernization of the B-52 and the ICBM are important? Sure. Well, it really gets to the mission of the triad itself, and that is deterrence, and deterrence through strength. And um, the ability uh, and the perceived ability to, um, you know, to, wreak destruction on anybody that would dare try it on us. And it's the amazing thing about particularly I think the ground based system is that it that it has worked. <laughs> we we've never had to fire a, a, a nuclear missile, either from a from a submarine or an airplane or from, from ground. Um and uh and and yet the efficacy of that you know fades with time and with decades. And so we, uh, you know, we need to modernize because our adversaries are modernizing. And in many respects, our adversaries have been modernizing at a much faster pace than us. The, the, you know, the, the winning of the Cold War uh, created a, 
uh, as, as I think a false sense of security in the United States and our, in our rather, um, you know, slow moving bureaucratic, you know, democracy, which I wouldn't trade for anybody else's form of government. Um, but it, it could be a little more efficient and productive. And, and so we've not invested over the, the decades like, like our adversaries have. And so modernization is both necessary and, and quite frankly urgent as we do this right now, Adam. I mean, I literally just came from the skiff with my House colleagues, House and Senate colleagues, and a whole bunch of folks from uh, the Department of Defense and JROC uh, going through a, a, um, a tabletop exercise um, to, you know, to look at various scenarios, to Taiwan uh, scenarios specifically. And so modernization is, is critical and it's an, it's an urgent demand. And these systems, both, both the Minuteman and the B-52, of course, are very old, 50, 60, 70 years old. And while some improvements have been made over the years and the decades, the fundamentals have not, and we, we need to do a lot better. Now, the B-52 is a, you know, it's a venerable system. It's older than probably both of us. And <laughs> it right. is a, <laughs> and it's a system that we plan to keep in the arsenal for, you know, mm -hmm. up until mid-century. And right. so, therefore, to make that possible, it's not certified to drop gravity bombs. The B-61 Mod 12 is, is, won't be certified for that. But it, it is certified uh, for cruise missile deployment. And mm -hmm. so, therefore, the, the long-range standoff cruise missile is really important uh, for this mission. Could you perhaps give us some indications or some explanation for the role as you see it of LRSO and perhaps uh, there, this was a system that there were some in Congress who wanted to cancel uh, a few years ago. Right. Perhaps you could share with us w what the sentiment is now on mm -hmm. LS LRSO as it moves into the future. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because depending on which anti-nuke person you talk to, they either want to they, they either want to get rid of submarines, um, you know, LRSO or ground-based. But it seems like for a long time, none of them wanted all three. Um, but that is shifting. So I might I, I think I'm going to go to the last part of your question first and talk a little bit about you know the shifting emphasis because um, not because um, you know certain anti-nuke forces or Folks or people or organizations have become less, um, you know, less anti-nuke, but because our adversaries have have reminded us of why it's so darn important. Now, when you see what's you know what's going on, obviously in uh, in Europe with Russia, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the threat of a, of a nuclear weapons itself reminds us of uh, of how fragile all of this is. When you see what's going on, obviously in North Korea, Iran, um, it, it's just obvious that we cannot. We cannot, you know, really get rid of any one of the three legs and still be as effective a deterrent as we need it to be. Um, so I would say that the politics has actually changed quite a bit in the last few years. And I think this year's National Defense Authorization Act is an example of that. And as we sit here right now, we're, we're on the, you know, the eve of passing another CR. God help us. That's a half hour show in and of itself. And at the same time, um, we're waiting, you know, to hopefully take up Either a Senate NDAA or a, or some sort of a conference report, uh, perhaps during during this October break, um, and and moving on that before the end of the year. So the two go, you know, the, the appropriations process obviously and the authorization process go hand in hand. And when you look at all of the things in the NDAA that that are very specific and deliberate deliberative toward modernization, I think you can see that the attitude is changing and that the opposition is softening to any one of the three legs of the nuclear triad. And I, I, I credit our adversaries as much as anything for that. Um, with regard to the importance of the LRSO and, and its role with Minot, the B-52s, as we've been saying, you know, it's a legacy bird, right? It's It's been around for 60 years. Um, nobody flying one. Um, they, 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 they had already flown many missions before the people that are currently fly, flying them were alive. And I know some of these young airmen are looking forward to flying them when they're much, much older. It's, it's really become almost a, a bragging right. The thing about, about the bomber fleet in general is the B-52 is the one that's sustained over the decades. You know, the B-2, um, has its, it has its benefits, uh, but there aren't that many of them. It's, it is, you know, it, it is, 
also, you know, it's a little less vulnerable than the B-52, but it, but there aren't that many of them. You've got the B-21, which aren't we all just waiting with bated breath um, to see? I have seen one, but I, I you know, it, it'll be exciting, but it's going to be a long, long process. So in the meantime, you have to have a reliable uh, bomber that can that can carry these incredible new modern weapons. But that that bomber has to have some improvements as well. So you know, re-engineering the B-52s is a high priority that's been authorized and, and funded, and, and we need to get that done. Um, the LRSO itself, of course, has to get done, and and uh, and we just we just need to have that that placeholder for you know decades, really, while we build out new new generation bombers and um, they're more stealth and can go into contested territory, go into those, you know, those difficult areas. Um, but in the meantime, we can get close enough with a B-52 to, to be very effective. Now, one of the weapon systems that you, you sort of mentioned this earlier that has been very popular with the disarmament community in terms of its desire to eliminate the leg, of course, is the yeah. ICBM leg. Right. And one of the things that I've always found interesting is the fact that uh, the fact that our adversaries place a lot of emphasis in their arsenals on the ICBM and on modernization of the ICBM. There was a right. recent test of, of Russia's Sarmat, you know, the Satan II missile that Right, you know, we can have we we've heard ten to fifteen warheads on it. He's he, mm -hmm. Vladimir Putin's called it a country killer, mm -hmm. and so but yet many in the disarmament community say we need to eliminate that leg of the triad. Now, sitting yeah. from your position, you know, what is your your view of this this debate? Yeah, so I think first of all, my view is that th those people are wrong, um, and I think it's I think that's been proven over over the years in in many respects. One of the things that they'll argue is that, of course, they're stationary, right? So that makes them easy, vulnerable targets. Um, and so they'll sort of diminish its effectiveness. Um, whereas, you know, submarines, uh, you know, airplanes, it, or for that matter, any other way that I remember at one time when I was working for a senator uh, 30 years ago, um, they, were, they were talking about putting them putting them on, on rail cars and hiding them and moving them around the country. That didn't last very long, but it was it was a serious idea. Um, and I think w what they miss is that having – that volume matters. I guess that's the point. There's, there's two things. Sure. There's, there's the, just having more of them. So having 400 ICBMs, which we, which we are going to maintain and we continue to maintain in authorization language while the Sentinel is being developed and, and um, replacing the – the, the Minuteman with, with the Sentinel. Um, but that's 400 targets that, 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 that an adversary has to worry about. And, and they're not unprotected targets, by the way. Um, obviously the modernization, uh, uh, you know, a Sentinel versus a Minuteman is, is, uh, uh, several generations improved in terms of its ability, its digital capacity, its ability to, to, to maneuver and move and all of, all of the things that we don't have to talk in great detail about to this audience. Um, but in the meantime, having all three legs means that we just have a lot more of the same of, of the weapons that can that can be useful, and that just adds to the deterrence value of it. And again, diversity matters as well. Um, you know, one thing can can be taken out an air whether it's an air, airfield or uh, you know, as stealth as submarines might be. It's, one thing can be taken out, and you still need to have that redundancy that adds to the value of its its uh, lethality, which of course then adds to the, the value of its uh, of its deterrence. Yeah, that's always been one of my the the reasons that I've always thought that we should have an ICBM leg is the simple fact that you can kill both the bomber and uh, submarine legs with conventional munitions, and you that's could. Right potentially wipe out the nuclear arsenal, whereas the ICBM leg, you have to take that, that much higher step of attacking the United States with nuclear weapons. And I think that's for the deterrent purpose, that that's something, that step is one where your adversary might go, that's that's a little too far for me. And, yeah. and you know, we've seen that our adversaries are reluctant, which is a good thing. 
It is a good thing, and we but we need them to remain reluctant. We need them to remain convinced that we can um, respond, and and that mutual destruction, as they say, is is a is a great deterrent, and and is is sort of nonsensical as that might seem on the on the surface of it. Um, the reality is it's really quite effective. So yeah, that's why modernization of all three legs is so important. That's why the ground based deterrent is so critical to this. To this fight, in, in in frankly, in avoiding this fight, um, and I just I think it just takes a little bit of explanation and discussion like we're having right now for people to sort of go, oh yeah, now that makes a little more sense to me. Now the the Biden administration uh, took the step of eliminating the submarine launched cruise missile, the nuclear slickem in uh, from its its uh, you know its budget its requirements. And you, you had mentioned earlier that you just did a war game in Taiwan. And as I've looked at sort of the scenarios, the, you know, the Europe scenario, the Sawak Gap, mm -hmm. and, you know, I've written some articles on this topic. And then as I look at Taiwan, I see the slick them in as playing a particularly important role in, in Asia where it plays, it doesn't really have that same role in Europe. And so as, as right. you sit on the, the SASC and you've got experience in the House as well, and you, you look at how the politics and the debate have been playing out on Slickham in, because there's been stories recently that there's a potential that Congress may reinsert funding for Slickham in development and research. You know, how do you see the Slickham in and the support for Slickham in? Yeah. So really important point. Um, because again, it gets, it gets back to that redundancy issue, but you've touched on the main thing. And that is what you want to always be prepared for is the, is the fight of the future. Um, we too oftentimes focus on the fights of the past or on, on legacy, whether it's legacy systems, legacy adversaries. And, and let's face it. I mean, the, the, the center of the defense map right now is this, is the Pacific and in, in the Indo Pacific is a big body of water. And we're talking about island states. We're talking about, um, big oceans. We're, we're talking about the ability to maneuver. And, and get as close as, as you can, whether it's to, to collect intelligence or whether it's to strike. And, um, this, the sea plays a major role in that. So I, I just don't know how you can have a, 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 a long adult, a serious adult discussion without talking about, about all of it. And uh, when you, when you look at the, the adversaries of the day that they, they, as we like to, some people like to call them near peer adversaries. I, I, refer to China as a pure adversary. Um, even if they're not where we are, um, they're moving so quickly that, um, th th we really have to get after it. And I think we have to give them the respect that they're due. Now, one of the challenges that we have sometimes politically, and that's why forums like this are so important, especially in light of what's happened where, where we overstated Russia's or, or, or you know, overbelieved Russia's, right. um, um, you know, um, Abilities. We, yeah. it, it, precise, precisely, we, we can't make that, we can't just presume that we're always wrong on the, on the low end. Uh, particularly with a, a country that is, is, has been as wealthy and has been as advanced and technologically advanced, a, a, a country that's been able to leapfrog a lot of the R&D by stealing and, um, I just think we have to take China very, very seriously. You also have other political, you know, situations and issues that I think change timelines and have escalated timelines and whatnot. We, we don't have to get into now, but, um, but China is, is our, our nearest peer adversary that we have, whether it's in space, air, on the ground, on the sea or under the sea, but it's all of them. And we can't leave any domain unprotected. And, uh, and that certainly includes under the sea. You know, I have this weird distinction coming from the center of the North American continent. I mean, mine, it is literally within a few dozen miles of the literal center of the North American continent. But I happen to, I happen to be the ranking member of the Sea Power Subcommittee. Um, so I spend a lot more time around admirals than I ever dreamt in my life I would. Um, so, I, but I, I think I do it with no bias. I really do see all of, all of the, um, the, the means of delivery as being important.
This episode of NucleCast is brought to you by the AMLA Deterrence Center, whose mission is to educate Americans about the nuclear enterprise and strategic deterrence. Now, many of our listeners are very interested in the debates and politics. And whenever I started getting involved in working with Capitol Hill, uh, John Kyle was, you know, was sort of the the guy in the Senate who cared about nuclear yeah. weapons. Sure. And you know, he, his time has passed, and he's left. Um, and so. You know, you as somebody who has a base like Minot with two out of the three legs, you're kind of in a unique position to understand and care about uh, the nuclear enterprise. So as you speak to your colleagues in the Senate and on the SASC, what is the sort of the understanding of the role yeah. of the nuclear arsenal is there widespread knowledge and understanding, or do you spend a lot of time educating your colleagues? What is that dynamic? Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, I think there's a growing understanding. And yes, I spend a lot of time educating my colleagues. I, I'm very blessed to be to be able to be not just on armed services, not just being you know, the ranking member of the CPAR subcommittee, but I'm on the Str Strategic Forces subcommittee as well, I'm chaired by Senator Angus King. Um, who's, who I consider to be a very bright, very thoughtful, very a balanced, a common sense leader. Um, and then of course, Deb Fisher from, from Nebraska, where Stratcom is headquartered, is obviously a strong advocate. And so, um, in fact, I just had dinner last night with, with Angus talking about some of this. I think the, the important thing is we, we, we had a, um, a, uh, SASC, um, a Codell, Come to Minot. There's no better way to demonstrate both um, the need and, more importantly, the need for modernization than to bring people to Minot, to have them literally see, um, you know, an ICBM missile, to let literally go down in into you know into the hole and see one close up, and just see how old and how um, mechanical all of that is. But then to go down to a command and control. Uh, facility and, and go down under the ground and deep, in, you know, and see the, the red phones, if you will, and the, and the three ring binders and the two keys. And, uh, and you, you, first thing you do is you get a very good realization of how well protected all of this is. In other words, the idea that somehow you could have an accidental launch is so absurd. But when you literally see it and talk to the, the airmen, um, you get a growing sense of confidence. But you also see that we're talking about really, really old technology, really old, um, you know, communication systems. Um, you see some vulnerabilities, but lethal. Be sure it's, it's lethal. While, while we modernize, we are still in, in, we still are in pretty good shape. Um, and, and I, I tell you that story because when we came back from that trip a year, well, now two years ago, and we went in to do the NDAA markup, and it was time for, for e the subcommittees to give their their um, updates before we started the voting. Angus King said, I wasn't convinced we needed the ground-based strategic deterrent until I went to Minot. And I'm telling you, we need the ground-based strategic deterrent. Now, that's that's pretty cool. First of all, that good for Angus um, for making – and then he told several jokes about Minot. But, um, <laughs> but, that, but that said, yeah, we have to always be educating – Otherwise, you know, you're forced to just sort of believe what you hear, and there's no there's no evidence like the evidence you see with your own eyes. Yeah, and, and so as you, one of the things that I, I wrote an article here maybe a month ago, because I've been in a debate in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist with some physicists over the role and importance of, of nuclear weapons. And sure. in the end, I had to come down to that in some respects, it's difficult to argue with staunch advocates of nuclear disarmament because for them, it's it's built into their worldview. 
And their worldview right. is sort of an, in, it's an idealism that we can create mm-hmm. the world we aspire to. And there's this real mm-hmm. sense of um, where, where sort of a Judeo-Christian worldview has a pessim- pessimistic view of human nature. If they don't share that sort of pessimism, then you can see where they don't have a desire. They think we can build our way out of needing nuclear weapons by creating the right yeah. kind of society. As you talk to your colleagues do you see that you're able to persuade many folks or do you see a lot of recalcitrance? Do you see openness to ideas? You, you mentioned Senator King and that's, that's wonderful that, you know, you were able to, you know, take him and he was persuaded, but do you see other folks, whether from your, your days in the house and you work with them now to your time in the Senate, is there much recalcitrance or is there a lot of openness to the ideas? Well, you know, the politics of the day um, is such that you, what you end up, what you end up seeing a lot more of is more people that come in with, with a very rigid worldview. And in some cases it's a very left one. And in some cases it's a very right one and they're not very movable because their ideals sort of trump common sense or reality, and they're not interested necessarily in learning a lot. I would say in the Senate, this is what's special about the Senate. The Senate, you know, there's only 100 of us, right? And we, we all have quite a bit of classified um, classified access and, and briefings if you're willing to take advantage of it, and pretty serious, thoughtful people. The House is built differently. I mean, that's it, on purpose. The founders created it that way. It's more impulsive. It's, um, you know, more obviously responsive to much smaller constituencies for the most part that, that are, that are more homogenous than a, than a full state. Now, in my case, I spent six years as the only member of the House of Representatives from North Dakota. So, but, but obviously that's not the way the country um, was was created in terms of our in terms of our self governance. So our responsibilities in each chamber are different. But but the long or the um, the ground based strategic deterrence is a good example. And this NDAA that we're in a debate right now, and, and uh, hopefully get done here in the next several weeks or or so. Um, the president, who's a Democrat, served a long time in the Senate. Um, you know, asked for a certain amount of money for, for to continue the modernization of the Sentinel, and both the House and the Senate NDAAs that came out of the respective Armed Services Committees have the same exact number as the President offered for modernization. So that tells you that people are being convinced. And and while it might be a harder sell, remember our NDAA now that we've passed what sixty times, sixty one times, I can never remember. Um, um, it gets to be a little later every year. And that's a problem. That's, that's a trend, I think, that's indicative of your question. And that is, is it getting a little harder to, to convince? It is. But again, the main salesperson in all of this lately has been Vladimir Putin, who's seen, who's running out of options to win a war against a much under, you know, under, um, you know, equipped and underprepared, uh, adversary in next, you know, next door in Ukraine. Um, He's running out of options, and, and one of them that, again, just recently, in recent days, he's threatened, of course, is the use of a nuclear weapon. So I, I just think the adults in the room tend to prevail in this debate. Um, that's not to say that, that others aren't going to be persistent in their, in their views that are contrary. But, um, you know, every now and then the world reminds us of just how dangerous it really is. And, but your, to your point, worldview does matter. And and seeing the world the way you wish it were instead of the way it really is is you know can hold people back, but for the most part, eventually reality slaps us in the face, and hopefully we it's hopefully it's not too late to respond. And and I feel like that's where we are right now as a country. We well, so realize that we have to respond. Well, so you mentioned reality, and Vladimir Putin has given us a dose of an ugly reality, and right. so as we think through it and. You know, Vladimir Putin has said that uh, he'll use nuclear weapons if uh, Russian territory is is attacked. Yeah. And so when he said that, you know, it's my my read on it that with the you know the the plebiscites that are coming up, the referendum in right. the Donbass and the the three regions in eastern Ukraine, he's essentially saying we've you know. We may have rigged these elections and we're going to take these territories and don't you dare try to take them back because if you do, we'll nuke you. 
And so this is really sort of the third time he's threatened the use of nuclear weapons. Right. For for your colleagues in the Senate, what's the mood and, you know, sort of what are the discussions as Vladimir Putin, you know, regularly threatens to use nuclear weapons against NATO and the United States? Well, I think it's got a chilling effect on, on members for sure. But um, I don't, but if I understand sort of where, where you're going with this, I don't think people are being lulled into a false sense of security because he's threatened before and hasn't done it. I think that as, as you see the response by people of, Russia, obviously, that's part of it. That that an all a whole of government um, approach to all of this includes obviously other agencies. It includes obviously intelligence. It obviously includes State Department and and um, but 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 when you see um, he, Vladimir Putin becoming more and more desperate, and when you read his writings, when you hear his speeches, it is clear that th- it should be clear anyway that this is a man that probably isn't really planning on going out of office, losing a war. And so I think there is that, that, that the severity of his, of his um, personality, um, his machoism, uh, I think causes people to be properly concerned. But, I, but there's also, I think, a growing confidence that the people of Russia um, are, aren't going to maybe tolerate it. And the, the question then becomes is, okay, so logic would tell you, you know, he can't, he can't launch a nuke. But we're not talking about a guy that's necessarily dealing in logic. A, a guy that calls up three hundred thousand, um, you know, troops, or you know, activates three hundred thousand non volunteers who may or may not have ever shot a gun. Um, that that's not a man that's thinking clearly. And so that so all that psychology plays into it. But then you, tr- I think, you know, my colleagues, and when we talk about you, you transfer that then to you know a guy who thought he was going to live forever and be the the uh, the permanent emperor of China suddenly finds himself in a political situation where, as I've often said, even an emperor for life with one and a half billion constituents has to pay a little bit of attention to what his constituents think, and um, they're all watching this play out as well. and And so I think a lot of people are trying to ascertain what, what's what's Xi Jinping thinking about what's going on in Russia. And here's the and, and here's what the point I really want to get to is it's not just us. It is our allies. It's the world community. So when you you talk about Vladimir Putin annexing um, these parts of Ukraine and, and calling them Russia with these sham elections at gunpoint, the, the world community is not buying it. And and whether it's NATO leadership or even United Nations leadership, people are calling them out. And the idea that somehow, um, you know, Ukraine pushing Russian troops out of Crimea is a violation of his, um, you know, his, his edict as some sort of a trigger point. Uh, I, I just, I, I would hope they don't do it hastily, but I think in concert with a very frustrated Russian, uh, uh, you know, citizenship, um, you know, it's it's not just about the weapons. It's it really is about the politics and the world community. And this is the signal, I think, that a guy like Xi Jinping has to be looking at and going, "Wow, not not only is Ukraine and the and the and the the, the will to fight um, for your own freedom uh, pretty powerful, um, but the world community is pretty much rallied around them as well. So it, it may not just be us versus them. Yeah, absolutely. And with that, we are out of time. But I do want to thank you for joining us on the show, uh, Senator Kevin Kramer from the Senate Armed Services Committee, the Sea Power. It's funny, a guy from North Dakota. <laughs> you, you said you had no bias, so when you're from North Dakota and you you know you're the head of the Sea Power Committee, then of course you have no you have no dog in that fight. So. Uh, that always allows. So that's a good point. <laughs> that, that, that's a, that allows you some freedom, right? But you know, you never know. You know, in in, uh, in even in a seven hundred plus billion dollar budget, um, you need a little leverage here and there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for show. Thanks for coming to the show. We appreciate it. We'll, of course, like to have you back. And uh, thanks always. to our listeners again for for uh, tuning in. Thank you. <laughs>